Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kathy Lean, and I am Managing Director of um, BK Asset Management and also founder of BKForex.com. And I'd like to welcome all of you today to this very special session on the euro, where is it headed next and how to trade it. Now, I know that many, many people are um, always interested in trading the euro because it is um, the most um, actively traded currency pair with, um, you know, generally speaking, the greatest liquidity. Of course, liquidity is dependent on your broker, but, you know, it's the one that captures everyone's interest the most. So we'll be talking about it, and um, we're going to be looking at how it's been performing, talk about different correlations, discuss where it, it, um, where it could potentially be headed, and if time permits, you know, share a little bit of, of, um, of some trading techniques. Before I begin, however, I'm obliged to read to, to you this disclaimer, so if you'll bear with me, I'll try to get through it quickly. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Trading Forex carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. The high degree of leverage can work against you as well as for you. Before deciding to trade any such leveraged products, you should carefully consider your investment objectives, level of experience, and risk appetite. The possibility exists that you can sustain a loss of some or all of your initial investment and therefore you should not invest money that you cannot afford to lose. You should be aware of all the risks associated with trading on margin and seek advice from an independent financial advisor if you have any doubts. The information, including commentary and trade ideas provided in bkforex.com, should not be relied upon as a substitute for extensive independent research, which should be performed before making your investment decisions. BK Forex LLC and bkforex.com are merely providing this information for your general information. The information and opinions do not take into account any particular individual's investment objectives, financial situations, or needs. All investors should obtain advice based on their unique situation before making any investment decision and should tailor the trade size and leverage of their trading to their personal risk appetite. BK Forex LLC will not be responsible for any losses incurred on investments um, made by readers and clients as a result of information contained on BK Forex LLC. BK Forest LLC do not render investment, legal accounting, tax, or other professional advice. If investment, legal, tax, or other expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional should be sought. Okay, so let us go and talk about the euro. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to pull up my um, chart screen. Can you please take a look at this and let me know that you can see, um, you can see what I'm looking at? And make sure that you see, just say yes, you can see my e-signal screen, and um, you can see basically, you know, my quotes moving up and everything like that. Okay, great. All right, so I'm assuming that's a yes. Well, we have a nice little pop higher right now um, in the euro dollar. And overall, we've seen quite a bit of volatility um, in the euro, at least on an intraday basis. Um, on a medium-term basis, um, you'll see that between November to um, February, we've had a very um, nice rally in the euro. And to put this move perspective, uh, what I want to do is I want to take a look at um, how much the currency of the euro has moved um, in the past three months. So right now, I'm, uh, I've got my Bloomberg screen up. Let me just kind of size it properly. And can you just confirm to me, anyone, that you see my Bloomberg screen? Just say yes or no. All right, fabulous. Okay, so what this um, screen shows you is how much of a move we've had in the euro dollar over the past um, over the past couple of months. And as you can see, against the U.S. dollar, um, the euro has moved you know, a bit, but not too much compared to some of the other moves we've had. The euro has fallen a bit. The euro over the past three months have risen uh, about four and a half, almost five percent against the U.S. dollar. Um, and it's had a similar and slightly more significant move against the Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, British pound, and Japanese yen. Japanese yen, I mean, take a look at this. It's almost 20 percent. The euro over the past three months has appreciated almost 20 percent against the U.S. dollar, against the Japanese yen. And these moves are um, a pretty big deal because these moves are happening over a very short period of time. And this is why we're engaged in what everyone has been talking about is, you know, potentially this currency war. 
Now, what is a currency war? I mean, basically, currency war this is a situation where countries around the world are in a race to debase. So in plain English, what that means is that countries around the world are um, simultaneously either um, talking down their currencies or moving into um, some monetary policy actions that would eventually weaken the currencies. So some have been doing it quite aggressively. Others need to do it. And um, one of the ones that need to do it um, is the ECB, or at least some people believe they need to do it. So today we've had a whole bunch of comments related to the euro. And people are watching um, basically the comments from Eurozone finance ministers quite carefully. And it's having quite a significant impact on the markets on an intraday basis. Because everyone wants to know, how worried are the Europeans about um, the, str the strength of the currency? How worried about, are they about these moves that you're seeing here? about the nearly 20% rally in the euro against the Japanese yen, the nearly 5% rally in the euro against the US dollar, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, and British pound. How um, serious are these concerns, and will they turn into policy action? Well, last week we had the European Central Bank meeting, and ECB President Draghi um, did express, for the first time in a while, um, or pretty much for the first time in his tenure, I would say, um, discomfort with the level of the euro. Previously, back in January, um, he, he was really relatively nonchalant about the euro, and he's like, you know, um, I'm not too worried about where it is. It's pretty much its long-term average. And at the time, you know, it was probably true because the euro was trading around 130.50. And uh, let's take a show you that right now. In January, the euro at the ECB meeting was trading at 130.50, and going into this ECB meeting, it was trading at 135.50. So it's a huge, dramatic shift in. Um, and how uh, much the euro has appreciated. So that's why last week he, um, he was not nonchalant at all because you know, the euro essentially rallied from 130.50 all the way up to 135.50. And so he feared um, that you know, if he was to act nonchalant, that it would cause the euro dollar to immediately rise to 137.50, 138. Because if you take a look at this big green candle here, and I wonder if I can use this annotation thing. Um, So I apologize how my arrow's pointing slightly left to where it should be. Um, actually, let's, let's go over here. So this is the candle of the January ECB meeting. And what um, Draghi basically feared is that if he was to sound nonchalant, he would um, basically cause the euro dollar to rally almost 200 um, pips, which is the same amount of movement in that we saw, you know, back in January. If just give me one second, I just need to um, uh, take care of this real quick. All right, sorry about that. So what I meant to say is that. He was afraid that we would basically see the same magnitude move this time around. So considering that the euro dollar was trading at 135.50 at the time, um, he feared that if this was the day of the, this month's ECB meeting, if he was to sound nonchalant, it would basically cause the euro dollar to rise another 200 pips, which would take it to about 137.50, which would be dangerously close to his um, what I believe is their pain threshold, which is between 138 and 140. And what I think is really important to remember is that um, you know, whenever if he were to sound nonchalant in you know the last week, what would probably happen is that the euro dollar would um, you know overshoot that level. It wouldn't just go 200 pips. You see in the left hand side of this chart, it went three days. Um, where I'm pointing right now, had three days worth of gains. So it probably have gone to 140. So in no way, shape, or form did he want the euro dollar to go to 140 because at 140 it is you know a pretty big um, deal and it is much more damaging to the eurozone than one than perhaps 135 or even you know 130 certainly 13050 when we had the last monetary policy meeting. So when the when um, Draghi last spoke, you know he. Let me see if I can get rid of this annotation thing. He um, basically said that, you know, we are monitoring the level of the euro, um, which is what he's doing. Let me see if I can get into my chart here. Okay. 
So what I want to do is I want to show you a monthly chart of the euro dollar. So in the euro dollar, you know, um, this is a, it was launched in '99, and so this is a slightly longer term chart of the euro dollar. So what Draghi said last um, week was that yeah, we're w watching the euro dollar. Um, but, you know, right now it's pretty much close to its long-term average. So if you take a look at this, you know, in, in uh, the low in the euro dollar um, in 2000 was at around 82.30, and the high in 2007 was right at 160. So if you take just, and obviously this is extremely, extremely rough math, which, you know, you shouldn't even use, but if you take a look at um, this move, I would say the mi midpoint of this move would probably be around, um, you know, the 120-130 region. So it's slightly above its long-term average, but it's not at a danger point. But once it gets above 140, then it is at the upper threshold of its band. And that's really where they would get much more seriously concerned. So today, this morning, we have a tremendous amount of vol in the euro dollar. This is a, a five-minute chart of the euro. You see all of these roller coaster-like movements um, in the euro dollar. And these roller coaster-like movements um, basically tell us that um, the currency is, um, is, is being subject to a lot of these comments that are coming out from the Eurozone Finance Minister's meeting. You know, earlier today, um, and it was at the start of the U.S. session, we had all, like, the French finance minister, as well as, as well as a couple of other finance ministers basically scream that the euro dollar was, um, scream that the euro dollar was perhaps, um, you know, overvalued. But this push higher that we see in the euro dollar um, is basically because of comments that we had from Wiedemann, who said the euro is seriously, isn't seriously overvalued. So, you know, I've been saying this on CNBC's Money in Motion, if you watch it, is that the only comments that matter are the ones from the ECB, not the finance ministers. So when the Bundesbank um, head Wiedemann said that, you know, the euro dollar is not overvalued, you know, I think that it's, you know, something that you should listen to. And, you know, obviously market watchers are listening to this because the euro dollar is rallying quite extensively. So the euro dollar is rallying quite a bit. Um, we know that you know the, that the ECB is probably uncomfortable with it around 137 to 140. That's because this is kind of the area where they started to get really concerned. So yeah, the question now is where to from here. We obviously see a nice little um, rally in the euro dollar today, and there was um, some resistance at 134, which is the former um, breakout point in the euro dollar. And so, if it closes above um, Friday's high of 134.30 then perhaps we have another push high in the euro dollar. Now this is obviously taking a look at it purely from a technical basis. From a fundamental basis, you know, I'm long-term bullish um, euros because I believe that there is still quite a bit of capital that is um, outside the region. There was a little bit of a, um, there was a, a report that was released a couple of um, weeks ago that talked about how, you know, capital flow was going back to the eurozone. But, you know, the amount of capital flow that was going back to the Eurozone was still nominal compared to the overall capital flow that's come out to the Eurozone. This was a report um, done by the Financial Times. It said that in 2012, we basically saw about 400 billion worth of, um, 400 billion um, euros flow out of the pigs, which are, you know, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, and Greece. Um, and then in the fourth quarter of last year, about 100 billion of that has flowed back. So what does that mean? Another 300 billion is still subject to flowing back to the Eurozone. And so that is why I think that, you know, on a long-term basis, the Euro is still headed higher. But we do have some near-term risks for the Eurozone that you cannot ignore. And those near-term risks are A, Spain um, is still, you know, in trouble because we have um, Prime Minister Rajoy embroiled in um, a scandal involving, you know, some corruption funds and so forth. Um, but that's not the only thing. Spain um, is vulnerable to the possibility of being downgraded to junk status um, by rating agencies. And the time frame is quite close. What I'm talking about specifically is that on February 22nd, Spain um, is expected 
to release its updated forecast on what they think their deficit will be as a percentage of GDP. And the whole idea is that if um, the deficit exceeds 8% of GDP, uh, or is expected to exceed 8% of GDP, the risk of a ratings downgrade would increase significantly. And there's, you know, a couple of um, rating agencies who already have Spain on watch. And Spain right now is rated, according to S&P, um, at its lo- a triple B minus, which is um, its lowest investment grade rating. So the idea here is that if the number, if Spain admits that they won't be able to meet their deficit reduction targets, then, you know, we'd be in trouble because Spain could be vulnerable to another downgrade. And if they are, you know, if there's talk of, um, you know, of another downgrade in Spain, that could cause some of the Spanish bond yields that we've seen to shoot higher once again. So that is one risk for the euro, which is a possibility of some bad um, or some disappointing def- debt deficit to GDP numbers for Spain on February 22nd. So circle that date on your calendar. And then as a result of that, some speculation that Spain could be downgraded. The other risk for the eurozone is um, the other risk for the eurozone is the um, Italian elections. Now, the Italian elections are essentially happening on February 24th to 25th. And the idea here is that the Italian elections is basically expected to be like, like basically a referendum on austerity. And um, if Berlusconi wins, then people are basically saying no to austerity. And if Monty wins, um, they're basically saying, okay, you know, we, um, we can deal with this belt tightening. And, um, you know, we know that we need it. So I think this is quite important because, you know, with the elections in Italy, it can create a little bit of political instability. And instability is almost never good for a um, currency. So I think that, you know, these two things could potentially lead to a little bit of profit-taking in the euro dollar. But once that passes, I think, you know, we have heard from Draghi that the the first quarter, the first um, half of the year could be a little rough. But beyond that, um, things could get a little bit better. So, you know, I think that, you know, those are the most near-term risks for the Eurozone and for the Eurodollar that you cannot ignore. And, you know, right now we're not focusing on them, but I think that, you know, considering that Feb 22nd is next week, I think that next week this will be a very, very big focus for the Eurodollar, um, for Eurodollar traders. And that could lead to a little bit of profit taking. So while I'm bullish Euros, I think that if we do get a little bit of a rally, um, to 135, 135.50, may want to take some profit on your long Eurodollar positions and wait for next week's event risk to pass before getting into those trades once again. But if you take a step back from a longer term basis, as I said earlier, there's still, um, 300 billion Euros worth of funds that need to flow back to the Eurozone. And so that is why you're seeing these fabulous rallies in currency pairs like Euro Pound. So right now, I've pulled up a chart of Euro Pound. I'm seeing a really nice, fabulous rally today. Euro Pound is the best performing currency pair today. And if you remember, back in the old days, if you were trading FX, Euro Pound was, you know, take a look at these candles, a much smaller mover on a percentage basis. It was not one of the ones that moved the most. And considering that Euro Pound pips are much, are much more expensive than Euro Dollar pips, that 1.2, 8.8% move is actually a much larger move on a um, dollar basis. Anyway, my point is that you're seeing Euro Pound rally, you're seeing Euro Swiss rally. Um, the, both of those currency pairs, particularly Euro Swiss, has come down quite a bit um, over the past month. And I think that you know, while the Euro dollar itself may not be a clean trade, Euro long Euro Pound and long Euro Swiss. Maybe, especially along your Swiss, since it's come down a lot more, may be a very interesting um, opportunity on a medium-term basis for another move back up to 125.50, if not higher. Because um, as the eurozone economy continues to prove, and we ha- go with some of these um, event risks um, with uh, Spain and Italy come to pass, people are going to start to look at Switzerland's negative interest rates, and they're going to think that um, you know. We should move our money more quickly out of Swiss francs back into euros because we don't have to pay. We don't want to have to pay for the luxury of being in francs if there's better opportunities out, out there. So I think that um, you know, from a euro perspective, while the euro dollar outlook may not be so clean, and we you know we still are bullish euros, I think that the cleaner opportunities could be in euro pounds 
and Euro Swiss, for example. Now, I get a lot of questions about Euro Yen. Euro Yen is enjoying a really nice rally today uh, because we had a nice little rally in Dollar Yen as well as um, Dollar Yen as well as um, Euro Dollar. So, you know, 125.50, which is um, Friday's high, is a pretty key level in um, Euro Yen. If it does rise back above that level, then, you know, we could head back towards these highs up here around 127. In terms of Euro Yen, it's all about Dollar Yen um, for the most part because this is what kind of really pushed Euro Yen higher. So if you look at a chart of Euro Yen and you look at a chart of Dollar Yen, which is kind of what we're looking at right now, they are, they are similar in um, many ways. So what I want to say about Euro Yen um, is that with regards to Euro Yen, um, the Japanese are trying to tone down some of their comments, the comments that they're making ahead of this week's G20 meeting because they don't want to be criticized for manipulating the currency, you know, ahead of this G20 meeting. So if they um, stop talking down the yen, um, we could see a little bit of profit taking in the yen, but I think that in the grand scheme of things, you know, dollar yen and hence euro yen is probably headed higher. And the reason for that um, is because, um, you know, Shirakawa is stepping down in March. So at this week's BOJ meeting, we're not looking for any type of major changes to the Bank of Japan monetary policy. But beyond that, um, we could potentially have um, a very dramatic change in monetary policy when the new Bank of Japan governor takes office at the end of March. In April, we're looking forward to some very dramatic changes in monetary policy that could push the yen, you know, to and above probably 95. So that's why, you know, euro yen dips um, uh, are still looked at as an opportunity to come in at um, lower levels. So. We took a look at the different courses, and you can fire away with questions later, and I'll get back to your questions. I also wanted to show you some interesting correlations. So we're back to my Bloomberg chart right now. I'm pulling up the euro dollar. And I'm going to load up a chart of the euro dollar right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going, a lot of people have been saying, okay, in the past, the euro dollar has had a very strong correlation with stocks, um, U.S. stocks, that is. So let's overlay U.S. stocks and see how we're doing first. So the gold line is the S&P 500. The blue-white area is U.S. stocks. So now I'm going to go slightly longer term before we get um, to the shorter term. And this is a chart showing you, you know, pretty much from 2002 all the way up to the beginning of 2012, and you actually say that over here too, even um, throughout 2012, there's been a very, very strong correlation between the S&P 500 and um, the euro dollar. But if we go to a shorter term basis, you'll see, especially in the month of February, there's a complete breakdown in the correlation where the euro dollar plunged and the S&P 500 climbed to fresh five-year highs. So what's going on? You know, all of us have been trading the euro dollar for, who have been trading the euro dollar for years, know that the currency pair is, um, know that the currency pair um, is a risk currency. So when people are optimistic, it tends to be bullish for the um, euro. When they're pessimistic, it tends to be um, negative for the euro. When stocks do well, the euro tends to rise and vice versa. But, um, things are changing, and things are changing in the sense that um, with the systemic risk in the markets receding, what's been happening is that the um, euro dollar ha is moving mostly on, you know, official rhetoric from, or, you know, P the ECB's comments on the currency, and, um, you know, to country-specific factors. Uh, but given how strong the relationship has been, over the past 10 years, I think that, you know, this correlation will eventually resume. And so that either means a pullback in the S&P 500 or a, continue, or a rebound in the euro dollar. And um, I think that in this case, you'll probably see a little bit of both. The euro dollar should probably be around 136, and um, the S&P should probably be around 1500. Now, let's take a look at the DAX, which is the German stock market. So this is the DAX. And look at there. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a DAX uh, short-term contract. But you can see, in the short term, 
Um, the, and actually, even in the long term, what you should be looking at is um, you, you should be much more so looking at the DAX versus the S&P 500 because the DAX is the um, German stock market whereas the S&P 500 is obviously the U.S. stock market. So you can see that there's a very nice uncanny correlation between these two instruments. So and in some ways, you can even say that there are many times when the gold line, which is the DAX, um, is a leading indicator of the blue line, which is the euro dollar. So that's the correlation that you should be looking at and not the S&P 500. And every Wednesday with our BK Forex um, clients, we um, have a World Markets Wednesday session where we look at all of these correlations. Not only what's um, correlating in the euro dollar, but also what's correlating in a lot of the other instruments like dollar yen and bond yields and, you know, Aussie dollar and copper prices, just to get a sense of what the other markets are telling us. Um, the other thing that I want, before we stop, before we move away from correlations, I also want to um, show you that Spanish bond yields are back on our radar. This is 10-year Spanish bond yields. We're going to overlay um, the euro dollar on top of this. And you will see that um, when it comes to trading the euro dollar, it's also important to watch Spanish 10-year bond yields, especially in this market cycle, because um, the uncertainty in Spain and Italy caused by the political uncertainty could lead to a little bit of more volatility um, in the currency. And if you watch these Spanish bond yields and you watch these um, German DAX, you can get a sense of where the currencies um, could be headed. So, um, Right now, you know, we talked about how the long-term outlook for the euro dollar um, is promising, but the shorter-term um, outlook is concerning. Not so much because of what central bankers are saying, but because of um, the political event risk in the euro dollar. And um, but we do have to listen in very closely to what central bankers are saying. I'm not too worried about, you know, um, their comments because if you took a look at, um, we're going to take a quick look at when um, Trichet used the words brutal and to show you how the currency pair moved. Um, in both the cases where Trichet, um, Draghi's predecessor, tried to talk down the currency, um, we didn't have a huge um, sell-off in the euro dollar until uh, a month or so later. So, Trichet used the words Bruto twice in 2007, and both in the month of November. First time used it was right around this period here, November 7th, November 8th. You can see that, you know, basically the euro dollar did dip initially, which you can say maybe was what happened on Friday, before it pushed higher and made a new high. And then in 2007, um, later on in November, he used the word brutal once again, and that's when the euro dollar finally topped out. Um, the only other time Trichet used the words brutal was in 2004, and I want to show you a similar price action. Um, also, he used the words brutal in November, right around this period where we had a dip in the euro dollar before it powered higher once again. So. Market's really afraid of Draghi using the word brutal. I'm not going to downplay the significance of it. Obviously, it's a very big deal. But um, based upon how the euro dollar traded after Trichet used those words, it wasn't really that bad. I mean, it actually, that dip in the euro dollar was actually listed as an opportunity to buy lower because usually it's fundamental factors that's driving the euro dollar higher. Now, a slightly more watered down comment that, uh, that um, Trichet also used which was um, not as powerful as the word brutal, was the words excessive moves. When, when Trichet was uncomfortable with the, word, uh, with the euro dollar move, but not ready to pull the trigger on um, either physical intervention or easier monetary policy, he would say that excessive moves are not welcomed. He used this three times um, between 2007 and 2011. Um, the first time was in the, uh, was in the beginning of 2008, right around here. And so this is where you saw this dip here in the euro dollar. It did dip lower, but once again, then it powered higher to a new high. And then he used the words excessive again in late 2010, um, which was right around over here, 
where you use the word excessive. And we did have quite a bit of volatility in the euro dollar. It did fall, but it rebounded, it fell again, and then eventually powered higher. And he used it in um, 2011 around, I think, April, um, which is right around here, and actually March, right around here. And you can see that the euro dollar dipped, but once again, powered higher. So in all cases where the ECB in the past, try, under Shea, tried to talk down the currency, we saw the dip, but the dip was seen more as a buying opportunity than um, a top in the currency pair. Not to say that history will repeat itself, because it doesn't repeat itself 100% of the time, but it's a possibility, so keep your eyes peeled for the possibility of um, a stronger recovery in the euro dollar. And that is actually, you know, a little bit of what we're seeing right now today. Okay, so with that, um, you know, I've got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to... Um, share with you, you know, a trading strategy for the euro dollar um, that um, has been working well in current market conditions, and um, you know, you and you know, I encourage you to look at it because I like it quite a bit. So, if you've ever followed any of my work, you will know that um, I adore Bollinger Bands. So um, one of the things I love to trade is my extreme fade strategy on Bollinger Bands. So um, for those of you that have never learned it before, you know, I'm going to share that with you right now. For those of you that know it, um, you know, refreshers are always, you know, interesting to lots of people. Then we'll get to questions. So with um, the Bollinger Bands, um, what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up my Bollinger Bands. 20 period, three standard deviations, because this is the extreme fade. This is a short-term euro dollar trading strategy. And then I'm also adding my 20 period, um, two standard deviation Bollinger Bands. Let me get in the third standard deviation Bollinger Band. Hold on one second. Let me move my box here. Bollinger Bands, third standard deviation Bollinger Band. And we use this on 15 minute charts. So the whole idea here is that if the currency pair rallies, 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 and the move is so strong that it touches or closes at the third standard, it closes at or above the third standard deviation Bollinger Band, then you want to watch for a turn. So this is short-term picking tops and bottom strategy. So you want to watch for a turn. You want to wait for it to roll and close below the first standard deviation, the second standard deviation Bollinger Band, and then you want to um, to short the currency pair targeting, you know, a uh, stronger reversal lower. So before we go to this current one, which is what you're probably asking about, let's look at some past examples so you can understand it. So here we have, um, let me get my annotations going. There you go. So you, here you have the euro dollar rally, 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 closes at or above um, the third standard deviation polar Japan. So it's on our radar. Then we wait for it to roll over, and then we want to go short the euro dollar. So we should go short here, maybe around 133.85. Stop at the swing high, which is around 133.90. So I would say about 10, 15 pip stop. And then what you want to do is you can usually, you know, um, go for a 2 to 1 risk reward ratio. So let's say in this case we're risking 15 pips. We're targeting 30 pips, so that would be about... Um, uh, 85 is um, minus 30 pips is 55, so you were taking off half your position, so you're taking off your position pretty much around these levels. Here, there's no trade because it didn't, um, although the candle rallied and touched the second, uh, the third standard deviation Bollinger Band, it didn't close there. So um, let's go back and let's look at some additional older charts. So here's another example. Closes at or below the third standard deviation Bollinger Band over here. Then what we do is we wait for it to essentially um, rally, close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So we're going along here at about 133.42 maybe with a stop um, at that swing low. So our swing low stop would be at 133.25. So I would say about a 18 pip stop. So our target is about 40, which is around the 80 You did the nurse's trade for a little while, but eventually the next day it's your profit target. Here's another example. Closes at or above below the Bollinger Band. So you're going along the next candle here at 133.80. Stop at 133.60, I would say, so 20 pips. So you go for 40 pips. So in this case, um, 
it would be 134.20, and it doesn't quite get there, and it stops you out. But that's fine, because sometimes not every, strat not every trade is a winner. Here's another example. Closes at or below the Bollinger Band. Um, then it turns. You're buying at around 134, and your stop here is at um, about 23 pips. Um, and so, you know, then it rallies in your direction. There's no trade here because these are all red candle closes. So, you know, there's not much of an opportunity here. Here you also want to do a turn trade. Sometimes um, you may not get the full 2 to, two to, two to 1 risk rewards ratio. I would say generally speaking, um, if you can get about 25 to 30 pips on the trade, you know, that's, there's a high probability scenario of that happening. So right now, um, we are creating that bit of a formation. We did close below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So you could have shorted maybe at 134.10 with a stop at 134.27. Um, so that's about a 17-pip um, stop, maybe targeting a 30-pip move lower or so. Um, if you want more details about this um, trading strategy, um, I actually have a report um, all about it that you can download for free. Um, just go to bkforex.com, and you'll see when the page loads at the bottom of the screen, there's receive a free Euro dollar trading strategy. You can just download the Euro dollar trading strategy there. Now, um, before I open up the floor to questions, um, I just want you know, to, to say that we offer news trades, day trades, and position trades. We have webinars every single day at BK Forex, and um, I t showed you one of our older trading strategies, but we talk about new trading strategies every Thursday that are in our laboratory. We give you an inside look on what we're doing, so we encourage you to um, check out all the different things we offer. Um, we have Forex Trading Signals, Trading Education, and um, these are some of the different benefits that we offer um, for our trading um, education. It's what we call market-centric education, where we have daily live trader education, which involves um, talking about trading strategies, talking about money management, talking about what's headed for the markets, talking about correlations. So it's not like it's the basic what is a PIP or what is a um, Bollinger Band or what is an RSI. We also show you the hottest chart of the day, um, some interesting um, trading opportunities, and we have an exclusive archive of trading strategies. Um, we're very transparent. All of our trading results are under our trade results page. So if you have um, any type of questions about it, I encourage you to um, go to our trade results page. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Um, that's very important to remember. But we post, you know, all the... Um, good and the bad, you know, all are on our um, trade results page. And then, you know, I encourage you to just kind of peruse through sites, our blogs and stuff like that. There's a lot of information there. So now I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you may have. There's some questions that have been posted already, so I'll go through them first, and then um, I'll answer any new questions that you may have. So um, one of the questions is the lack of correlation the euro dollar also happened in June and July of 2012. Yes, there will be times when... Um, we do see the euro dollar deviate from the S&P or deviate from the DAX. But most of the time, that does not last for long. Um, and eventually, the correlation will resume itself. What percentage of the time are you a fundamental trader and a technical trader? Um, we subscribe to, uh, to a technique that involves both fundamental analysis, technical analysis, and actually sentiment as well. So what we like to do is we use our technicals to identify key levels, but we use our fundamentals to help us identify, um, identify potential, potential um, catalysts to get the trade to move in our direction. So I would say, you know, it's probably 50-50. And, so, and I think that's important for everyone to be. Um, have a good balance between fundamentals and technicals because that's always something important to pay attention to. Do you mean that Spain is now driving the euro? Um, in some ways, yes. Spain and Italy are going to come back into focus um, over the next week, and you're going to hear a lot more about that. So um, definitely pay attention to that. Yes, we, I still trade the extreme fade strategy. It's best traded um, during the active market hours, which is, tends to be from 2 to 3 a.m. East Coast time to about noon time East Coast time. What do I think about Draghi's speech tomorrow? Very important. Um, you know, 
it's something that it's it's definitely you know now that Draghi has talked up sorry now that um, Weidman has talked up the currency. It will be now up to the market to watch Draghi to talk down the currency. So um, I think he's going to reiterate what he said um, last week, which is that, you know, your dollar is on our radar. We're watching it carefully, so you should too. What do you think will impact the yen at press conference at BOJ on Thursday? Um, if you look on my Twitter feed, which is at KathleenFX, you will um, see that... Um, I posted a link to an article um, that gives you my BOJ preview. I encourage you to read that because it answers all your questions. Um, is the Spanish bond correlation positive, i.e., the higher the interest rate, the higher the euro dollar? Um, it is actually a um, negative correlation. The higher the interest rate, the, um, the more negative it is for the euro dollar in terms of Spain. Spanish bond yields, because people look at Spanish bond yields as a sign of uncertainty for the eurozone. Um, whereas, for example, if we looked at U.S. bond yields and dollar yen, it would have a positive correlation. What do you mean near-term euro dollar support is at 130.170? Well, let's pull up the euro dollar well real quick. Um, I don't think I said what near-term euro dollar supports at 130.170 because the support is going to be at these lows here, which is at about 132.70. And I'm glad you enjoyed my purple boots on CNBC Money Emotion. And, you know, I actually didn't even need them because Snowmageddon um, was, uh, was like a little flurry here in New York City. It barely, I think all the snow is pretty much melting right now. Any other questions? Um, if you guys are interested in learning more about um, fundamentals, we are giving a crash course on um, fundamentals, and the webinars start this week, so I encourage you guys to check it out. This is our crash course um, on fundamentals. There's a lot that we're going to cover, all these correlation stuff with different instruments, how to trade each of the major currencies, so definitely check that out. I see all the questions about the yen, about the pounds, but today is all about the euro, so that's really um, what we're going to focus on. Um, yeah, if we do another session on the yen, the pound, that's what we'll be talking about. And we've got another minute left. I know that FX Street's got to move on to the ne next, uh, open up the floor for the next presenter. So um, if you have any questions about the euro, fire away. If not, um, feel free to contact me. Just hit contact box. Ask me any additional questions that you may have, and just check out our website. The strategy that I introduced to you is not just for the euro dollar, but it works particularly well in the euro dollar. So I said that, that there were two event risks for um, the euro dollar, which is Italy um, and Spain, but you know the G20 I think is kind of is going to be somewhat important um, as well. And if you want more on the euro dollar strategy, um, if you're looking at my screen right now, it says, it says uh, receive a free euro dollar trading strategy. The one that I'm um, that's going to be sent to you is the one that um, I talked about briefly. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry this kind of harried today. It's been crazy market conditions. Um, but hopefully we'll have something more fun to talk about next month. And as I said, please check out our website. There's lots of great stuff that we're doing. And we're doing webinars every single day. So about all this stuff and lots more interesting stuff. So give us a try. We have a trial, one-week trial. So definitely check it out. Thank you.